Hello friends, T.S. Eliot, as a critic, he is rebellious, as a poet, he is revolutionary. I think that you will agree with me. Now, today we will discuss T.S. Eliot as a critic. Why did I say that he is a rebellious critic? Now, let us look at some critical pronouncements of T.S. Eliot. You will see that his, his is a towering presence in the critical world, in literary criticism. Look at some of his pronouncements. See that? First one you can see. No poet, no artist makes his meaning, complete meaning alone. So a no poet, no artist makes his complete meaning alone. That means, what does that mean? It is like saying that no man is an island. Means you are related, you are connected. The moment you start writing or painting or writing a drama, any of this, any of the works of art, you are connected. That is what he says. You cannot make meaning in a vacuum. You are surrounded by. You have to be within an environment. Without that you cannot make meaning. More of this we will see later. A second one you can see. What is the second one? He says about criticism. How should criticism be or where should criticism be directed? Honest criticism and sensitive appreciations are not directed upon the poet, but upon the poetry. First time we are hearing this. That's what I said. He is unhappy with the existing situation. That's what I said, he is rebellious. When a person is unhappy, he wants to change the situation. When he changes the situation, he becomes rebellious. That is it. So, uh, uh, till then, the attention of the critic, critic was directed to the poet or the artist, not the, his work of art. Now he says, now there is going to be a U-turn, he says. Or you can see, there is an about turn. Ah, that is better, about turn, not a U-turn, about turn, see. From the poet, you have to change to the poetry, his poetry. Another interesting thing is his definition of tradition. And this essay is about tradition and individual talent. We are going to talk about that. And this was published, as, I, as you know, in 1919, first in Egoist, and then it was included in the Sacred Wood um, collection of see, essays on poetry and criticism. Now, as you can see, this essay, it really caused heartburns in some. In some people, uh, it was as if they were waiting for it. It's a great change in them. I say, coming back to this uh, tradition, that is the word, no? tradition. We know what is the meaning of tradition, but that is not the meaning here, as you can see, as we proceed further. Traditional, or what makes a poet traditional? What gives a poet meaning? The first quote I, I just gave you this as, at the beginning of this uh, lecture, I told you, no, no poet, no artist makes his complete meaning alone. Now, uh, then what, what makes the meaning? Says the historical sense. And what is it? The historical sense, which is a sense of the timeless and the temporal, and the timeless and the temporal together is what makes a poet traditional. That, that's very interesting. No? The past tense and the present tense or present continuous should run together. Or there is a happy confluence of, a smooth confluence of the past and the present. Or you can say a very a, a happy meeting between, so to say the tradition, the existing, and the new. So that is what makes historical sense. 
So remember, historical facts are not historical sense. You can go on studying historical facts. You need not get the historical sense. An example I would like to tell you, I will give you is an orange. You can go on studying orange. Fruits, its different parts, etc. How it is produced, how it is cultivated, all this. But you will not get the sense, orange sense. When will you get the orange sense? When you start eating it. See that? So history, fact, collection of historical facts will not make you or give you historical sense. But historical sense is something when you, it's very abstract, but we will see a concrete example soon. Something that you should get into your blood and into your veins. Only then you, the poet becomes a historical. Understand? See, take, let's take another one. All this I am just, uh, all these quotes I am giving you, just to show you how rebellious T. C. Lead was in his approach to literary criticism. Now let us see the another one, that is the relationship between the past and the present, or the timeless and the temporal. What does he say? He says, the past is altered by the present as much as the present is directed by the past. There are two key words. One is alteration, the other is direction. What gives alteration? Past can be altered. Very important sentence. Very important uh, statement here. Very, very important. Actually, this is the what I must say the nucleus of this essay. The past is the altered by the present as much as the present is directed by the past. So there is a the relationship that you should note here. We will further explain this. Now, let's say another one. All these statements that I want to tell you, they are new and path-breaking. Actually, they are revolutionary. They are path-breaking. Or you can say they, are, they have got a, what a, something new. New uh, blood has been injected into, into this old way of criticism, you can say. Another is about the emotions in poetry. How he makes difference between personal emotion and the art emotion. Says, poetry is not an expression of emotion, but an escape from emotion. Because there the distinction is between your personal or the, or the artist's personal, personal problems and emotions and the other things like that. Uh, and the emotion that is produced or created in the work of art itself. Sometimes I, sometimes I think like that, I would like to share this with you, the relationship between a hen and an egg. See, the hen, after a process of synthesizing, then sacrificing, surrendering, eating many things, ir irrelevant things, incongruous things, unrelated things, Finally, what happens, like a poet, uh, finally what happens, he lays his egg. That egg, uh, what happens, the hen is not the egg. You don't find any of the troubles and tribulations that the hen underwent in the egg. And when it is taken to the market, nobody knows whose egg is this. See, so then, then what happens is, the sufferings and the sacrifice and the surrendering and the synthesizing and all those things done by the hen has nothing to do with the, this egg. Egg is an egg. When you see an egg or uh, when you eat it or when you deal with it, the egg has got its own emotion. So you cannot say, you can you take an egg and say this is that particular hen's egg no, no, after all, why should we know that? So that separation, I just give an example only. Examples may not always clarify things, but in this case, I just I wanted to show you the separation. The hen and the egg, the poet and the poem. Look at that. Because synthesizing, etc., as you will see, this is very important as, as far as the artistic process is concerned. Another statement that this read makes is again very interesting now. 
It's not the expression of personality, but escape from personality. Same thing. Again, hen. You can see expression. The person personality of the hen is not expressed in the egg. <laughs> is it? No, nothing at all. No relationship at all in that way. So these are all new ideas, new approaches, new thinking. You can say. As far as literary criticism is concerned, that's what I told you right in the beginning. He is rebellious, and he is path-breaking. His statements are conclusive. His statements are fine, final, so to say. His statements are compelling. His statements are authentic. His statements are authoritative. You can see. You say, say now there is a finality in it. No, no poet, no artist makes his complete meaning alone. that is final there's no question of any any doubt about that right so exactly like that all the statements you will find present is all there and past etc etc now what's what is after all this essay about that's what i i i, I have been thinking here in one word you can sum up the entire essay tradition and individual talent can be summed up in just one word and what is that word that is relationship relation ship that's all it deals with this relationship and all the other ideas uh, that is that that this uh, around this you know this relationship it comes from this relationship so to say now the as i said about relationship whose relationship with what that's the point whose relationship with what the it is about the poet's relationship poet's relationship to one tradition his relationship to tradition and two his relationship to his own work his own work that is it. only these two you have their relationship and relationship first to tradition and second to his own work when you discuss this you will end up in impersonality of art impersonality and then when you discuss this you will see what is meant by a poet to be traditional what is meant by complete meaning that a poet can produce what is the what is meant by complete meaning what is meant by saying a poet is traditional for that you should know in the essay itself you will find there are many similar expressions tradition for example one is very interesting and is interesting in the sense that i tell you that is what we say the pastness of the past pastness of the past that is one expression tradition means the pastness of the past very abstract now when you say the goodness of the good we say the goodness of the good isn't it the cleverness of the clever pastness of the past that is one other or you can say in simple english you can say past and past past and present past and present or you can say timeless timeless and temporal temporal or you can say in the say in the essay itself all these things are given the literary world the entire literary world or you can say <laughs> the existing order simultaneous Ex- existing order yes or again literature from homer to homer to the present homer to present again you can say other all the other poems all the other poems written by by other authors other authors 
up to this time it is an order existing order or you can say as i have already shown you tradition means pastness of the past that means past and the present temporal and the timeless timeless and the tem together or you can say the entire literary world right up to this time entire literary world or you see the existing order there is an order right from the beginning to the present there is an order so from beginning to the present when you say past and present means only up to up to the point when another author starts writing that's the thing up to that it is past and present that is pastness of the past see for example if you say present 19 2018 up to 2017 there is that is tradition january 1st 2018 somebody start writing then that is temporal that is the way it is it has to be considered till the, till 2017 31 december this pastness of the past or timeless and temporal or past and the present or all the literary works so far or the existing order of literature that's the thing that is what is meant by tradition so what is tradition you understand means the entire literary world right up to the moment a person an another a new person starts his work of art or the same person starts his new work of art so it can be both way you can say like i hope that is clear to you what is tradition now the question is what is this tradition and the present the new the the present and the new the relationship and the relationship is very clearly stated you see that is the past is altered by the present as much as the present is directed by the past that is so to take a, a concrete example as a 31 12 70 okay so up to this timeless and temporal from time say let us say bc or even before that from bc to this that you can say the pastness of the past that much or the temporal now this exist there is an existing order up to this point this can be altered by the present present means say another person or another work 112018 this can be this work 112018 can alter this past how how i will give an example a simple example of this school uniforms you know school uniforms let us say there is an order like this different schools different different uniforms like this then what happens is you small you in our know, school uniforms let us say uniforms of boys black pants and white shirt okay and then you have got an order like that existing order of uniforms or the girls you can see blue skirt and white jacket or blouse whatever it is or you can the red or anything so there is an order color may change but there is an order now at a particular point this order is there this is this existing order we say the past or we say tradition the past or the tradition and then here comes another person or another school with the, a new a new uniform what is that new uniform this black pants white shirt but there is some embroidery and the name of the school written there or some such a, uh, what do you call novelties but it's not anything that is coming uh, created from a vacuum it is created on the basis of this tradition understand but here comes a fantastic accepted an accepted uniform but it is new then what will happen this existing order of uniforms will undergo a change 
change your alteration and then this uniform will be admitted into this order when it is admitted into this order what happens the present alters the past i give you give an example and now you take take the example of poetry you for you have an order already existing order of poetry right from beyond form which let us say narrative poetry and all kinds of poetry then 1922 up to 1922 is uh, november is it november it is existing order then the wasteland appears on the scene at uh, the wasteland demands admission to this order and the wasteland enters in this or in this order and the past order changes so the present alters the past ha uh, but anybody cannot a new thing or something very strange cannot there are some parameters for that what are the parameters the parameters for a work of art to change the existing order these elite says in this say one complex it has to be complex so as an if somebody says he writes a poem like this the train goes the train comes people enter and get down there is a crossing accident many people die and then the writer of this poem says this is a fantastic modern poem because it tells about the existential problem of travelers the train is going and coming that is symbolic of our going and coming like that and nobody is going to consider that as a poem why because it is not complex another point is there is no concentration in the essay tsl says you require immense concentration you sometimes tsl says in the essay no the things that you find so ordinary become great poetry in the hands of a poet or in the mind the mind of the poet becomes a smithy as james joyce says uh, refers to the mind the artist mind as a smithy in the portrait of artist as a young man so the mind of the poet is a smithy and in that smithy seemingly or apparent, apparently irregular in congruous unrelated materials coming and there is under immense concentration there is a process of synthesizing and out of that an artist a new work of art is produced so you need the immense concentration you need uh, you can think of say if i take the example of wasteland if like a taxi throbbing waiting you are seen taxi throbbing waiting you know but when it comes to that particular place in the poem it becomes great poetry as well as the tsd says about the othello othello's remark when uh, desdemona's father and uh, his uh, as soldiers they come to attack othello othello says no keep up your bright swords for the dew will rust them and uh, eliot says it's great poetry why in ordinary language in ordinary situation it is nothing but in that particular situation you should know you should know the attitude of barbancio and othello the situation there uh, you know all this i need not explain that it becomes great poetry the same thing his appreciation of metaphysical poets there is there is a sensibility there sensibility me so you may think that countries how many what kind of comparisons is makes many many countries traveling in many countries and then you know the metaphysical conceit seemingly outside that poem outside that work of art it has no uh, we must say this prosaic but the moment it becomes part of the poem it becomes great poetry so here also you can see what about uh, that archduke and her, his cousins sledging the 
we went, uh, went, went down in the mountains and, uh, and they talked for Adam. Uh, sorry, the summer surprise is coming out of the Strandberg, you see, with the shower of rain and we stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the half garden. Then comes a, a German, a German, somebody is speaking, uh, Bingar. Uh, I am not Russian, I am the, I am pure German. Nunga or Russian, Stamina, I was led to an Deutsch. See, comes then another, another, uh, she says, and we went and talk for an hour, then he says, uh, he and well, my Archdukes and my cousins, when we were staying at my arch, uh, Archdukes, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Mary, Mary, hold on, right? What is that? He said, Mary, Mary, hold on, right? Outside that particular situation, what is, it's not poetry, but in this particular, that environment of the poetry, it is great poetry. Understand that? So that is what it is. If it's a train goes, comes, that is not poem. You cannot say it is. A, so if such a new, what do you must say? Novelty for the sake of novelty. Uniqueness for the sake of uniqueness. Individuality for the sake of individuality. That will not be accepted in the tradition. Such works of art can never alter tradition. So what is the what is what is one of the criteria criteria for judging whether a work of art is great or not? Whether it has the power to alter the existing order of literature whether it can change, whether it demands admission to the existing order and thus readjusts the existing order, then it becomes a great poem. That is tradition, pastness. How present in this into the past. So that sentence you remember? The past is altered by the present. So, so take the example, or take all the great works, Shakespeare. They had an existing order of plays, dramas, tragedy, comedy, revenge play, and all those things. But when Shakespeare comes with his plays, what happens? The, the tradition welcomes. Tradition welcomes. Tradition says, come, come, enter. And the tradition says, we are, we are ready to adjust ourselves. Tradition is not a human being, as I told you, it is a simultaneous order. Again, that is phrase used by in this essay by T.S. Eliot himself. So simultaneous. What is simultaneous? The timeless and the temporal. And timeless accepts the temporal and the timeless adjusts itself to accept this temporal because it is great. It is great why? Because immense concentration is there. Complex work it is. There is synthesizing and the synthesizing is done by the smithy of the artist. Of course, in the second part of this, you'll see the smithy of the artist is not a very important thing. And finally, an art is produced with its own emotion, not the emotion of the emotion of the poet. It has probably nothing to do with the emotion of the poet. Because seemingly, apparently, incongruous, unrelated things put together. See, taxi throbbing, I told you, you know, that is a very good example. So, there are, though, if you go through the first part, you know, the burial of the dead, just for the sake of well, there is the focus, the concentration. See, the, I can see April is the coolest month. And uh, therefore, winter is welcomed. And summer comes, but at the end there is cruelty. I read much of the night and go south in wind, loneliness. Immediately after that, the focus remains. What is that? What is the? What are the roots that clutch that biblical? And after that, you find all those things: uh, dry stone, etc., etc. I shall show you fear in a handful of dust. The focus remains. The concentration, the immense concentration of the poet remains there. Further, you see, to stand and I saw same theme, but in a different way, and the hyacinth girl. Same thing, but in the focus is the same. And you come to Madame Sassos, why? Because everybody is dying. As you say, he who was living is now dead. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. That is the wasteland. 
That's why April becomes cruel. Look at that. How you, the entire thing is interconnected. So the synthesizing, it took under, it, 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 it took place under immense concentration of the poet, the synthesizing. Therefore, what happens? You don't find any gap. That emotion is, emotion is held up like this, continuous, continuous. This is one of the reasons why uh, T.S. Eliot criticizes Hamlet. This is the necessary emotion it does not reflect. Because there is a kind of uh, what, what, diffusion, diffusion. But if you take the wasteland, I am just giving you, really, uh, I have already given 11 lectures on the on wasteland, but uh, so I don't want to bore you with the uh, repeat, repetition of those things. But just uh, going, see what is it, like a grasshopper jumping from frame to frame. You can see that, and immediately after that, you get a hyacinth girl say, ah, say, I told you already, madam, so, 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 they are all, all the people are going there again. That focus is the same. April is the cruelest month. See, then comes in the unreal city. So many, I had not thought, death had undone so many. See, and finally, the corpse, the buried corpse, that is also, in the, in the wasteland situation, it, it cannot sprout. Has his, has, I think that the, he's asking the question, no? Any, any change has taken place? No change has taken place. Because that is what we must have petrified, anesthetized. The world is anesthetized world of the wasteland. So very clear, you know, that focus. But different frames are there, almost 11 frames in the first section. But all the frames, they are pointing to is the same thing. April is the coolest month. Why? That is great poetry. So what happens is, the past, the present alters the past. You understand that point? Yes? That is clear, I think. Now, as I told you this, now, what happened? There is change. Or you take another example. See, Muslims, you know, Muslims, like Taj Mahal. So there is an existing order of Muslims. But then what happened? Then comes Taj Mahal. So, the order of that... Uh, stately tombs, Muslims, no? that is changed and accepts Taj Mahal. So the past is altered by the person. Michelangelo's paintings, Joseph's Canterbury Tales, Joseph's Canterbury Tales, my uh, uh, T.S. Eliot's poems, as just now we are discussing that. So all the great works of art, the paintings of Picasso after that. All the great works of art. What happens is they demand admission because of their greatness. And what is the criteria for great, judging the greatness? As we have already seen three. Immense concentration, syn under, uh, uh, synthesizing under immense concentration, synthesizing of seemingly irrelevant materials. Outside that poem, it is just prosaic, a taxi throwing. What is it? A taxi throwing. The, the arrival of that car bungler young man. See? The house agent's clerk and their encounter, his sexual encounter, or wasteland situation. April is the cruelest month. It begins from there. See, every frame in, this, in the poem, you can see it's directed towards it. That is pastness. How pastness of the past is altered by the temporal present. That's what is his historical sense. A sense of the timeless and the temporal and the timeless and the temporal together. See, you can see that here in the school uniform, you can see. In stately tombs like the Taj Mahal, you can see. Paintings of Michelangelo, you can see. Paintings of Picasso, you can see. So after something, yes, I like T.S. Eliot or better than T.S. Eliot. Somebody produce or write supper. Then what will happen? It, that, that will enter the tradition. And again, then that present will change this past. So that is what the meaning of the existing order of things. You can change the existing order. In politics, you find no? Exist, that can be for good or bad. Hitler changed the existing order of things. Mahatma Gandhi changed the existing order of things. 
There may be existing order of things to be changed. There should be some value. Without that, just now I told you, somebody is riding a train, comes and goes. There is an accident and people die. This is existential point. You cannot say, <laughs> nobody is going to admit that. Because there should be some, some criteria for that. See, if it is worth that, if it is valuable, any work of art is valuable, then it will find a place in the tradition that is existing order of things and it will change the tradition, it will make an impact on tradition and then tradition expands. Understand? Yeah. So that is, I think, tradition. Timelessness and temporal. You got the point, of timelessness and temporal. Literary world, the entire literary world changes. Readjusts, so to say. So that is, therefore, this relationship is traditional. Therefore, traditional doesn't mean old fashions. Traditional doesn't mean appreciation of a particular period of literature. Tradi tradition doesn't mean a preference for few others. Tradition doesn't mean preference for few forms. Tradition means the entire order of the literary world, including the, the moment, the moment of writing of a new work. A, a, a writing of a new work which is worthwhile, which has got the power to demand admission into the existing world. I hope now you understand what it is. So tradition is not, we say about traditional jewelry, old fashioned, traditional architects, old fashioned. That is not the meaning of tradition here. I think I have made it clear what is tradition, what is meant by tradition and timelessness. So when a new work enters into this, that becomes part of tradition and it becomes timeless. All the great. Doesn't mean canonical. Canonical, uh, that will be preference. No? There may be many works of art which are not canonical, but at the same time they part of the they form the part of the tradition. They have altered. Now say what is the second part of the sentence? The the past is altered by the present as much as the present is directed by the past. So all on a sudden, you cannot create anything in a vacuum. You have to have that sense of the entire literary world from Homer to the person. That sense should be, when you write, when you do anything like this, when you paint, when you write, when you write a play, when you act a play, that, that sense of the entire literary world should be with you. Not that, that you have to read all the poems and all the dramas, all the novels and all the short stories written right from the from Homer to the person. That won't make you, uh, that won't give you historical sense also. That will not make you traditional also. That is a fact. In that case, all those people who have written uh, histories of literature, they do, do you think that they are traditional? Not necessarily. They have written some facts. But you have to feel it in your veins and in your blood. And that with that feeling, that requires, of course, what we say, the sixth sense, not the fifth, fifth. No, all are not poets. All are not playwrights. Those people have this. So what happens is, is they, they uh, become such people, such works of art, can alter the past, at the same way, they are directed by the past. That is, they have got their historical sense. Once again, I would like to repeat that, uh, uh, that statement, the historical sense, which is a sense of the timeless and the temporal. And the timeless and the temporal together is what makes a poet traditional. I hope you understand. So, no poet, no artist can make his complete meaning alone. He is attached to tradition. It is like the umbilical cord that attaches the fetus to the womb of a mother. Can't exist in 
in a vacuum. No writer. So strangeness, uniqueness for the sake of uniqueness, novelty for the sake of novelty will not work. Will not work. So it has to be within certain parameters. And these parameters, you get the sense of these parameters by having a sense of the literary world right up to now. So that is the meaning when we say tradition is tradition. Uh, the meaning of tradition is that the timeless and the temporal. And the timeless and the temporal together. The past is altered by the present. The present is directed by the past. You can see all these actualized, you can say, practiced, you can say, in the wasteland. Make a close study of this wasteland, you will find this. You will find how the present alters the past, how the present is directed by the past. And in concrete examples, you can say, if you, uh, you, you will find no, there are about, uh, about how many? 40 references, multiplicity of references. And the multiplicity of references, you cannot just say uh, two lines of yours and then. Uh, Something you caught from the past. Uh, if suppose you write a poem like this, uh, life is uh, life is very interesting, life is very beautiful, and then you you immediately write the sweet uh, uh, head melodies are sweet and those on head are sweet. <laughs> that won't work. <laughs> Such things will not work. There, therein comes the sense. We can't take you can cull a few lines from somewhere and write, write within that, insert it, you, you cannot do that. That is not hard. See, if you want to know it, you read, make a close reading of T.S. Eliot's poems themselves. Then you will see what is meant by the historical sense, how synthesizing process takes place, the artistic process, that's the thing. The most important thing is the artistic process. I think I have explained what is meant by tradition, isn't it? So, Tradition and the individual talent is about, you can sum up in relationship, nothing more. And many times you now he is repeating this, uh, Eliot repeats this, you now he says, what is tradition means? It's a pastness of the past. You may think that it is something abstract, no, no abstract, because you get this concrete examples, concrete statements like it. Timeless and the temporal, timeless, you know. We say when Shakespeare's plays are timeless. Why do we say it is timeless? Because it is part of the tradition. How has it become part of the tradition? Because it is, it has fulfilled all these three criteria. Synthesizing, immense concentration, and complexity. At the same time, focusing. Whether there is no focusing, where there is no focusing, definitely you will criticize that. Saying that the, whether it is Shakespeare or anybody. You, I, I hope you got the point now, isn't it? So, as a, the tradition and individual, individual talent, talent is a path-breaking one, no, no doubt about that. He has thrust upon us, we must say, many new ideas about criticism. The nature of criticism underwent a sea change. See? Those are pearls that were his eyes. <laughs> That's what he said. The sea change. Your eyes, so far, they were only eyes. But you are drowned in this traditional individual talent. These eyes become pearls. Such sea change has taken place. That is because of his new idea, the idea of tradition. The idea of tradition is a tremendously dynamic one, I must say. As conceived by T.S. Eliot. It is not old-fashioned. It is not... Uh, uh, I already have told you, not preference for uh, preference and order or period or a particular uh, work or uh, no, nothing of that sort. It has nothing to do with that. Tradition is the existing order of the literary world. In the, it's like a club. See, you have to enter that club. You have to be. You have to prove yourself uh, that you have got the qualities of that club. The qualities of a person who can member who can enter that club. For that there may be many qualities. So this happens everywhere, in everyday life also. 
in everyday life. You go to a marriage feast. You are not properly dressed, you will be thrown out. <laughs> that is simple. The marriage feast has an order. There is a pastness of the past. And you go there without a proper dress. You are, you are wearing a lungi and a benin or something. You will be thrown out. But a better dress, you will be admitted. And then, next time where there is a marriage feast, sometimes people will, people will adapt your way of doing things. So, this tradition, this relationship with, uh, with the past, individuals, individuals in society, in social life, culture, everywhere you find this. But in poetry, of course, this is what tradition is, means the entire literary world. The simultaneous order of the past and up to the present, up to this point. See that? So, then what decides, judgment is given by three parameters, cons immense concentration, complexity of the work, and the artistic process, or synthesizing. What they have, the, how, how much effort has gone into this? Then a new work of art is created. And the new work of art has nothing to do practically with the author. That is what it says. Of course, the third part of, this is my first part, I am explaining tradition. Second part, of course, I will be explaining what impersonality is. Now it is, it is already implied what is impersonality. And third part will be, I am sorry to tell you, a vehement criticism of the Assyrian tradition. <laughs> That's what I am going to do, whether you like it or not. But that will be, all, of course, supported by supported by facts and figures. No doubt about that. So I think that I have explained tradition to you. You understood what is meant by pastness or past. Remember, this, this uh, expressions I have taken from the essay. It's a past essay. Somewhere here and it is sprinkled, so to say. There's a general sprinkling like this. What is pastness of the past? Whenever he says, it's a dynamic concept for T.S. Eliot. At that time it was something new. But of course, there has to be some, uh, you have to have a relook on tradition. Is it possible? Is such is such a uh, such a relationship to the tradition naturally will lead to what is called uh, impersonality and is can we agree with T. S. Eliot in this uh, say impersonality concept and tradition their relationship etc. That I will analyze in uh, my third lecture. This is my first one and the second one will be about impersonality. Let us see uh, if you have got any uh, new ideas. If you have got any objections, if you have got any objections about the examples that I have given, the hen and the egg, school uniform, Muslims, Muslims, so to say, Taj Mahal and things like that, chase places, my, my, and all those examples I have given you, you can definitely contact me, Professor Thomas Matthew at gmail.com. I will always welcome your criticism. Okay? Till then, bye. Have a nice time.